Hello, and welcome to The Canadian Story, where we discuss what Canada is, what Canada could be, and what Canada should be. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Canadian Story. (laughs) Today, we are joined by Natalia Zouk. Natalia, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. You're very, very welcome. Natalia, why don't you give us and the listeners just, you know, the elevator pitch, the 30-second bio on who you are, what you do, and what you're all about? Uh, Well, I run my own music school, so that's fun. Um, I'm currently studying uh, vocal health and safety and rehabilitation for injured voices, which is also super cool. Um, I studied performing arts, and I'm currently working on releasing my own music with you, Zach. Uh, it's yay, me. Zach. I, I might need your help on this recovering voice thing because I've, oh, yeah. I've Actually, definitely yeah. been harming my voice deeply in the last little while practicing with our, well, the band that I'm helping produce. Uh, or I guess yeah. I'm funding the production you're producing. Yeah. yeah. The uh, David uh, sent me a, a song just a, a couple weeks ago of, of him singing, just yelling. Like just, just oh no. screaming into the mic. And it was so funny. He's like, you know, I'll, I'll, you know I, it's sore right now, but I'll probably be, be better in a couple days. I was no, like, no, no. I, I was no. not better in a couple days. In <laughs> yeah, fact, no, that's not. No. <laughs> Actually, if you go back, I don't know if they're out yet. The JJ remember. McCullough. My voice is just shit on that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you go back, if you listen to JJ McCullough's episode, uh, if you listen to David talk, it's because he's been singing like a dick and he can barely talk. <laughs> oh, my God. Well, voice health is something that I'm more recently concerned about, I would say. <laughs> Well, there you go. But that's actually a great thing to get into. But before we go yes. there, Natalia, we want to hear what you love about our great country, Canada. Wow. What a, what a country. What a place to be. Um, really, I think the coolest thing is that, I mean, from my perspective, you could do anything. You can come from like any background and you can really literally just do anything. There's a lot of programs and government support and stuff. I mean, you're talking to someone whose family immigrated over from Poland and was like, we want you to have a better life. So, <laughs> you know, I, I was raised with that kind of mentality, but like in all actuality, like there is so much support and funding and grants and stuff and just a lot of opportunity for you to get yourself off of the ground wherever you're coming from. I've seen people go from being like absolutely like bankrupt and broke and having nothing to opening incredible businesses and becoming really, really great entrepreneurs through those kinds of programs uh, within like a year, two years time. So it's it's really crazy. I don't know. I think that's pretty cool. <laughs> that is pretty cool. And um, if you don't mind, why don't uh, you just give us the short story of uh, the grant that you received because you were the recipient of a grant recently. And why don't you tell the listeners about that experience and how it helped you out? Oh my gosh. Yeah, that was a time. Um, I actually applied last year and I didn't get it. There were some issues with like my business plan and whatnot, but I got to reapply, revisit all the stuff. Um, It's basically, so it was the Starter Company uh, Plus program, which is a program designed to help um, people in the startup of their company just kind of get off the ground. Um, with like, there's a competition where you're trying to receive a grant at the end of the program, but you also get so much training um, on the way. And that's one of the reasons why I really didn't mind doing it two times through because you get to really just do a lot of networking and meet a lot of really great um, people uh, just starting up a lot of different varieties of businesses in the area, which is really cool. Um, And also just meet a lot of young professionals and, and everyone was just so supportive. Like you have people that are really, really like top dogs have been on Dragon's Den and they're like, Hey, do you want help figuring out this issue you're having with your clients? Hit me up. Let's go for coffee. Let's talk about it. So just an all around really supportive community. The education is incredible. They really cover everything from like branding to marketing basics and um, just a lot of really great useful tools to make sure that you're actually going to do really well when you start up, not to mention a $5,000 grant that went towards supporting a little recording studio for my kids. So that's super exciting. Uh, so what was this a federal or a provincial program? Uh, I think it, I think it was provincial. 
Because I used to, uh, in, a, in a former life, I oversaw the distribution of the Canadian Heritage Art Funding, well, all Canadian Heritage grants and contributions. And hey. so I a lot of applications over two years, about, I guess there was about 12,000 I, I wrote memos on. So I know exactly the importance of that. And I, I have to say, Canada really does do a good job of supporting local art, I think. Yeah. So we wish it would do more, but it is really something that's awesome about Canada, like you said. Yeah. For sure. So let's talk your school. You started a music school. What was that yeah. experience like? Oh, wow. Well, it was like, it started off as like low key, very casual. I didn't really realize I was like starting a school. I was just kind of teaching and that's all I've ever done. I, at that point, I hadn't really had any other jobs. Like I had only been teaching music, uh, like piano, voice, guitar and stuff to kids. So I was just kind of doing it on the side. Um, and then I started to want to get it, I don't know, like a little bit more professional. I really do like, I have a lot of different random hobbies and interests. So I do like graphic design. I like playing in Photoshop. So I was like, ooh, let's build a business name and let's make this more legit and get people really excited. And it just got more and more like professional. And I started taking on that role too. Like as I started developing like my brand and and starting to dip my toes into marketing a little bit more, I didn't come from a business background too. So that was that was fun trying to learn all that just on your own. Um, but yeah, as I started to step into that more professional aspect, like my work ethic started to get more advanced and then I started to want to get more certifications and, and be a better teacher for my clients and, and really, really strive to stand out from all the other music schools in the area. So my strategy improved like crazy, like it just kind of snowballed from there. It's been a really cool experience. I want to pull something out what you just said you said your work ethic improved why do you think mm -hmm. that is um i don't know i operate uh i'm i'm a special kind of person i uh what can i say when i start to get passionate about something or i notice that i'm making a difference in somebody's life i want to do so well for that person or that family i want them to feel like the product that they're paying for is exceptional and if it's not i feel guilty so you know as i'm starting to put on this face and me like oh i'm a young professional i'm an entrepreneur i'm doing all these things i'm like i better damn well be a young professional like you know so I don't know. It just kind of, it trickled into me wanting to just do really well for these kids. And, you know, now I look at it in a very, I don't know what the word is, like a philanthropic perspective, something, I don't know, where I just feel like it's up to me now to raise these great kids that are really, really struggling in a time like COVID, right? So. Absolutely. Well, and you know, it's interesting, you, you say it's philanthropic, but I see it more as value creation. You're trying to create value for these people in their lives to make their lives better. Yeah, absolutely. And that's awesome. But that doesn't necessarily have to be philanthropic because you're not just doing them. A, you're not just giving to them. You're actually, you know, you're being paid for that service. Like you said, yeah. you are a professional. And and mm -hmm. I, I want to pull out more of what you just said. Like you're, when you became passionate about something was when your work ethic improved. And I think this is something that people completely underestimate. Right. They, they're like, oh, I'm a hard worker. I'm not a hard worker. Right. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they take that on as their identity. Well, you just pointed out something that I think the listeners should really pay attention to. What if you're passionate about something? What does that change in the dynamic? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know. It's it's really interesting. And to kind of flip the coin on that, too, like I I was teaching for a lot of other companies, too, along the way. And a lot of what really kickstarted me to do my own thing and separate from there um, was when I just noticed that they didn't they didn't care. They didn't care about what their clients were pulling away from their business and their services. They, you know, I don't know. I, I just saw a lot of unhappy clients coming to me being like, we wish this was better. And I was like, I wish so too. I see what you see. I feel for you. I empathize for that. And then I was like, hang on, I can do something about this. And so that's what inspired me. But I don't know, like seeing the other perspective and seeing how certain other business owners choose to operate that I disagree with. Like, I, I want to set an example and do something different locally. So 
I, I have a question. <laughs> okay. mm. Who taught you to take personal responsibility for your actions and your outcomes? Oof. Where did you get that from? I don't I don't even want to say. <laughs> oh, an ex-boyfriend that I hate. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what? He, we can all take things from these things. Our our life is a journey and we should learn from even our mistakes, right? <laughs> he was an asshole sometimes, but God, he was intelligent and he really did teach me a lot about accountability and um, he was a business owner. He is a business owner. He's the example that I gave earlier that went from bankruptcy to, you know, opening his business and doing really well and get it going from being broke to having a house within one or two years. Like that blew my mind. So his work ethic and drive did rub off onto me too. And he taught me a lot of great things. So what can you do? Oh, well, there you go. That's you cool. Know. Um, so how long has the school been open? And I, I'm not sure if you've said it or not, but if you haven't, what is the name of the school? And where can people uh, find it? Yeah, Aria Music Academy. Um, you can find us online, www.ariamusicacademy.ca. We're all over the socials. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. We're everywhere. We have YouTube. You can watch all my kids' recitals on there. They're great. Oh, that's, oh, that's fun. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And so how long have you had the business? Uh, ooh, two, three years now. I think three years. I just want to go back to what you said earlier because uh, I found it very interesting where you were saying that you saw things that other businesses were doing that you didn't mm -hmm. like. You don't have to tell us who those businesses were, yeah. but what were these things that you noticed? Um, okay, there's quite a few, but a big one is just client retention was really bad and for a reason, right? Like when you're the approach that I have with my clients and what I capitalize on is customizing curriculum based on their interests. So I'm very actively involved with the parents when I get a client register and I ask them directly, I'm like, what do you want from this? What can I do to give you exactly what you want out of this program? Um, because you have people, you know, some people will come in and be like, I want my kids to do RCM exams. Um, I don't really work with that type of clientele, to be honest with you. I tend to uh, attract kids that are more interested in songwriting and in even considering careers in the arts. And I love to explore that with them and be like, look, like I'm working on it myself. Like I can share with you everything I've learned along the way. I'd love to be a mentor while you do this. I love doing audition preparation, master classes with kids. Um, so we just take a very, very different approach to that. And right out the gate, I'm like, do you want recreational classes? Do you want them to just have fun? We have kids that come in with disabilities and they just want to, you know, explore some better cognitive development and all that good stuff. So I openly have that conversation with my clients as soon as I can to make sure they're getting what they want. Um, I haven't seen that really anywhere. Why, why do you think that is? It just seems, I love, I love that. Um, we'll get into that this more later, but why mm -hmm. do you think that is? Why are, why are, or is it just because they have so many clients that they just, it's, it's a numbers game or like, why don't they care about the people that are providing them with their money? Well, you know, okay, so I have a little story to kind of explain my perspective on this. So I was working with one of my previous employers on their um, marketing strategy, and they wanted me to do some graphic design work for them and all this good stuff. I sat down with them and I was like, okay, so let's talk about like your value proposition. Let's talk about your your message. Like what, what stands you out from your competitors? Um, and they were like, I don't know. I was like, okay. Um, so let's take this studio, for example, um, they really capitalize on, you know, family and they treat their entire, uh, like all their kids in their community, like, like one big happy family and they have their family very involved in the business. And that's a really cool thing to capitalize on and, and share that with your clients and make them feel like, like they have a home away from home. Like, that's really cool. Like, what do you think of that? And they're just like, meh. I don't know. And I'm like, okay, so why do you do this? Okay. And they're just like, I got to pay the bills. And wow. I was like, dude, dude, <laughs> like, okay, like I get it. Sure. But it just blows my mind. I'm like, wow, this is a really, really successful business that operates this way. But again, it's the client retention that's missing. They have kids dropping off left, right, and center. I haven't seen people stay for more than a year there. And my clients, I've had kids stay with me for as long as five years already. 
Right. So, right. So you, you know. so you found a niche where it's actually about the people as much as it is about the product. Yeah. Well, I don't maybe know. Maybe the people isn't are that, the product. Isn't that the way it should be though? Yes, like yes, they're exactly. paying for your services, right? And again, you have people that come in that are like, I don't know what I want. And I'm like, that's okay. I'll just give you everything. And then you tell me as we go down the line, what you're interested in. I have some kids that just want to learn like how to play guitar, super basic. Let's read sheet music. No problem. And then I have other kids that are playing piano that are like, look, I wrote this song. And I'm like, do you want to write it in official sheet music online with me over Zoom? Like, that would be fun. And their <laughs> eyes, like, light up, and they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, you get to be a songwriter. And they're like, what? And it's like, these kids don't even know that this is possible. And I think it touches close to home for me because, like, I grew up not thinking that this was, like, you know, careers in the arts or being a musician was anything anyone could do. Like, you got to be a doctor. That's where the money is and all that stuff. So I think being able to share that with my kids and be like, yeah, you can write a song. Why the heck not? You're five years old. Go for it. Let's do it. So yeah. it's it's really cool to give them that power. And I'm I'm excited to see how these kids grow and, like, what what happens when they start becoming young adults and what that does for them. So I don't know. It should be about the people. I don't know. I 100% agree with you. In fact, we've had uh, our other cousin, Dan, we were, him and I and Zach are working on this kind of concept called the lexicon of labor. But the idea is you cannot separate capital from labor. And in a similar note, I think you're, you've just added a whole idea here that I want to bring into it as well, which is, and you can't separate people from labor. Mm -hmm. Right. You can't separate the idea of the individual, but the the individual emotional human being that you're dealing with is not just a number on a and this is what's happened in our modern world with dating and with everything is we've commodified commodified things, right? We've said, Oh, this is your value as a number. Absolutely. I and I think, yeah, I just love that perspective because I mean, not only is it a good perspective to have just as a human being, it's a great perspective to have as a business owner, because like you said, now you got client retention. Yeah. Which is yeah, nice. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. It's nice when people come back yeah, to you as a business yeah. I mean, owner. it also pays the bills, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. But you can do both. Win, Exactly. Win, that's win. the thing. That's yeah. the thing that's missing. And to be honest with you, it's it's easier. You have to spend less money on advertising when people are so happy with your product that they go out and tell their friends, hey, look at what our teacher did. Or, hey, this the, our teacher put together this cool recital and they share it with their friends and family. Like, it's it's more efficient, to be honest with you. So I don't know. I don't get why this isn't common sense. I feel the same way about my business. Word of mouth has been by far the driving factor of of what has helped me grow. And word of mouth is generated from happy clientele and happy clientele is generated from caring about the people you work with. Yeah. It's simple. So you've you've left the employee space and now you're in the business owner space. Mm -hmm. What do you see as different in your life from those two from that transition? Because actually both Zach and I have also made that transition. So it's an interesting discussion to have for the three of us really. Uh, I don't sleep anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah. Nobody tells uh, you how much work it's going to be. Oh, <laughs> no one tells you. No. Yeah. <laughs> Free time is just doesn't exist anymore. I can't like, this is so jokes, but so true. But like, I can't, I can't relax. Like, I just can't take a load off because I, I'm really actually struggling right now with the element of really wanting to push things forward. We're looking at opening an actual physical, like legit studio location for the first time. Um, and I have all these ideas and these concepts and these things I want to achieve before we get there. And it's so hard to sit down and just take a load off when you're like, man, I should be really planning our, our opening and all this stuff. So I find that going man, I do miss being an employee. Like I do envy that about a lot of people that I talk to these days. Cause I'm like, it's really nice to go to work, do your best and maybe a little bit more sometimes. And if you do, it's well appreciated and then leave your work at work and then go home and relax and then do it again. There's something really special about that, that I do miss. Um, it, it's tough because now I'm trying to find the balance of, 
you know, maybe I'm an overachiever and then it gets to the point where it's like, okay, you got to pull back and look after you sometimes too. Like if you just keep giving and keep giving and giving and giving into your company, you're not going to have anything left for you. So it's a tedious balance, but it's also incredibly rewarding because I get to do all those things we already talked about, right? Like I get to see the change that I'm causing in my clients' lives. Like I I get to feel really, really proud of the work that I do. And and I feel really proud of where these kids are going. And, and it's, it is a lot more rewarding. And, you know, now I'm looking at hiring employees and I'm getting to employ people that I value and want to bring onto my team and start to open up a collaborative process, which I've been dying to do. So it's, it's really, really special, but there's a lot of cons to it too. So I don't know. You know, the best thing I did for work-life balance Mm. I got married. <laughs> hey. It's true. I'll, it's, I'll tell, it's pretty I'll, hard to stay to stay married and not have some balance. I'll right? tell you what, when I've worked a 10, 12 hour day and I and I do this and I leave the studio and I come home and I sit down at my desk at home and I open up my computer and I'm like, I'm gonna do more emails. Oh my god. My wife is like, nah, you're no, not. you're not. You're uh you're done now. <laughs> you're, d- you're done, kid. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Zach, uh, <laughs> advice for everyone, right? Get I've, married. <laughs> I'll, just, I'll just go I've, get married. That's no big deal. Let's yeah. see. I've outsourced uh, my work-life balance to my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Love it. Well, I, I want to go into that, though. I think too often we <laughs> – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, I guess, uh, I'm going to contradict, but too often we say, oh, it should always be balanced. But there, there's a time to reap and a time to sow. Mm-hmm. Right? And right now you're in the reaping phase, but I'll tell you this right – or sewing. no, the sewing phase. Sorry, yeah, sewing phase. man. Sometimes I get though. Like yesterday, I was I was on a Zoom call and I'm like, dot your T's and cross your eyes. I kept <laughs> saying it like some like like I'm mentally dis. Uh, like, if you're confident, no one will know the difference. <laughs> yeah. You're fine. Anyway, the long the long and short of it is, um, you're going to be in this place for a while, but then you're going to be the boss of yeah. a number of people. And Zach is moving into this place right now where he's just starting to outsource everything that he doesn't want to do and only doing the things that he loves. Mm-hmm. And once you get to that point, it's no longer that what you're feeling, right? It's just that right now you're carrying the burden of everything. Like you don't have any, it's just you. And that is, but that phase is the time where you're putting in the 17 hour days where you can't sleep, where you're, oh, but you're excited, right? Yeah. An interesting thing that I've found is a lot of employee people, like, people that are in employee mindset, they're tired. They, they're not excited about their lives. Like they sleep a lot. Part of why mm-hmm. you can't sleep is because you like your life so much. Yeah. Right. Oh my God. I've had some of those days where I'm just like, I wake up in the morning, I check the clock. I'm like, man, it's, it's literally 4 a.m. But I, <laughs> I'm pumped. <laughs> I could literally wake up right now because I'm so excited to work on not just my business, but also my career and my passion projects that I'm like, I need more hours in the day. And everyone's always complaining there's not enough time. And I'm like, get up early and get a head start and it'll change everything. Oh, you just so, spoke and, his love language. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yes. What, what time do you get out of bed? Uh, okay, well, right now, right now is a different story. I'm a little bit tired lately. We've been sleeping in a lot till like 10, 10, 11. But, no. <laughs> but that's going to change today. <laughs> One of the best things I did for my productivity is I started getting up at five in the morning. And the reason mm-hmm. is, so I get up at five in the morning, I shower, I get my life together, I drive to the studio. I'm usually at the studio for quarter after six, 6.30 in the morning. And... I have a solid four hours where no one bugs me. No one wants to mm-hmm. call me. No one wants at my email. Like No one's messaging no you. No one's messaging you. And I have the, a mentor of mine called them his sacred hours. Those are my sacred hours. They're my most effective hours where I just plow through so much stuff. And then the rest of the day... Frankly, my productivity probably wanes a little bit. <laughs> Did I get that tired. right? Waxing oh, is bigger. Wane is smaller. Yeah, waning. Yeah, yeah you're, I was. Yes. I was curious if I was uh, I you're dotting right. my TV across <laughs> in my eyes. Yeah, <laughs> this is going to become the great joke of this podcast. I love oh it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, like, throughout the day, I, I become less and less productive. But those first four or five hours are amazing. And you know what? You handle so many things before anyone even starts their day. And so yeah. they. Other people, the people around you start their day and they get to the beginning of their day and, and you have already done the things they need 
You and do. so you're, they're not coming to you. Where's this? It's already there. It's better. It is the way. It is the way forward. <laughs> this is oh the my way. Gosh. The it is. Big, the big problem, of course, is not all of us are capable of 5 a.m.s, but... All of us are. It's just that we choose <laughs> not to be. Yeah, that's the thing. When I started trying to switch up my sleep schedule, like, oh my God, it was hard at first. But then once you just flip it, you just got to go to bed earlier. It's not that hard. Yeah, I well, tell a lot of nothing good happens after midnight. Realistically, nothing good happens after <laughs> nine p.m. <laughs> okay, I, I don't agree with that. The great things happen oh between the hours nine p.m. and midnight. But <laughs> yeah. you know what? You know the easiest way to go to bed earlier. Mm. Get out of bed earlier. True, you're gonna be tired. You'll want to oh, go to bed. Yeah, early. that's what I've been having to do because I've gotten into like just kind of you know I don't know lazy bones mode, and I'm just like you know what I'm just gonna pull a day where I I hate myself and I get up at like seven or six thirty, and then we'll see what happens. I'm gonna be tired and then I'll be able to go to bed because the problem is is once you start sleeping in, you start staying up late, yep. and then it's Actually. just a cycle, and you can't stop sleeping in because you still need those whatever eight nine hours, and then you. You know, there you go. So you just have to kind of do a, like a little reset and then you're good to go. And let's not sugarcoat it. It sucks. It's no mm. fun. Oh, yeah. Even when you're in the swing of it, when my alarm goes off at five in the morning, I'm like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> but the reward is worth the pain. There is there is another yeah. option, which is the route that I went, which is get a husky and then you'll never be able to sleep in again. So. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Uh, so, Natalia, I want you to tell us about getting vocal nodes, how you got them, why oh. you got them, how you got rid of them. This is coming out you... for the first time ever. <laughs> and how you will never get them again. Oh, there we go. There we go. And as oh we touched God. on earlier, David. Uh, yes, I need to learn this. This, this is an important. This is a valuable uh, lesson for me. <laughs> Oh my God, this is crazy. Yeah, I I actually haven't come out to talk about this yet. This is this is a big deal. Um, you heard it first on, on the, Canadian the Canadian story. story. <laughs> true, true story. A lot of people, there's a lot of stigma around it, to be honest with you. I want to start with that because I've actually been advised to be cautious about whether or not I do want to come out with this because, you know, coming from a musical theater background and and having a vocal injury like can look really bad and there's a lot of stigma around it and there's a lot of research still being done about how to rehabilitate voices and just voice therapy and everything so it's like it's a very dodgy topic but I'm totally open to it so here we go um but yeah so I was in my intensive triple threat training program uh back in college that was absolutely insane. The hours were ungodly. It was three years of schooling smacked into two years time. Um, so it was just exhausting. Um, your body is tired to shit. Uh, you're emotionally exhausted because the acting program is just intense and you're trying to figure out how to manage all of these crazy emotions and these really, really heavy sometimes concepts that we're trying to understand. Um, so just, I don't know, it's just a very fatiguing program. And then you go home and you're expected to do all this work before class the next day, but you've been at school for 14 hours and you don't even have time to actually make dinner and eat well to take care of yourself. It was just kind of like structured to like, what, how are we supposed to get through this alive? I don't understand. Um, so, you know, during all of that time, um, I came into that program as a singer first. So you had different people across the board. Um, I did singing, acting, and dance was at the bottom for me. Um, so, you know, my voice was really, really important to me. And I was working on really, really challenging material. Um, I have some qualms with how the program was laid out in a way that I feel that people who aren't prepared to tackle challenging material um, were thrown in a little bit too quickly uh, into uh, a performance style setting um, in our classes. So, you know, you basically get there and they're like, all right, you guys all need to really take it down a notch and work on basics such as breathing for like an hour before you're even prepared to start like working on this other stuff. So it, it was difficult because 
you know, I really needed to go back down to basics and address some of my breathing issues, um, address some tension issues. And then I'm stressed out enough as it is from the program. I hop into a musical theater performance class. I'm belting my face off and I'm maintaining a lot of tension and stress. I'm not well rested. It was just a recipe for disaster. By the end of my time there, I had notes. Um, so, And for the listeners who don't understand, what are vocal nodes? Uh, yeah, so vocal nodules, it's, it's a vocal injury where um, essentially when you, when you sing or you speak, uh, your vocal folds are like flapping against each other constantly. Um, and depending on how high or low or how loud or soft your pitch is, they will go faster or slow down. Um, in the musical theater industry, it's really big right now to do what is called as belting. Um, and you're basically just like singing really loud and really high and it's intense. And what happens is your vocal folds are, if you're doing things with a lot of tension and incorrectly and you're pushing too hard like I was, your vocal folds start smacking against each other. And what happens is like, well, really with any part of your body, if you repeatedly have that what's that called? That punch to anything. Like if you're learning guitar, you develop those calluses on your fingers, right? It's the same thing on your vocal folds. It's just like skin. Um, So you develop calluses on your vocal folds from smacking them together so much. Wow. Yeah. So now all of a sudden you have these folds that it's so, so important that they connect to be able to create the sound. And it's so, so particular, like how they have to touch in order to create a specific vocal tone. Now you all of a sudden have these calluses forming on them, these two like lumps on either side um, that are preventing them from closing properly. So when I was trying to sing, I didn't really realize it had happened until it was too late. So, and they were already developed. When I would try to sing, I would just get air. So I would try and hit a note and it would literally just be like, <sighs> no. like because they're not able to close right. because there's something in the way. Um, so I couldn't physically sing. I would, as a result, I would get angry and frustrated and I would push harder and then I would get a note. So I'm like, oh, that's the, that's the solution. Let's just oh, sing no, even so that harder. Made the problem worse. Absolutely. So, you know, that's, that's kind of how it, it came to be. Not fun. Not a good time. So, so you developed the nodes in school. Um, mm-hmm. you were still able to pass your course though. How did you manage that? Yeah. Um, so basically what happened sheer, is I was a sheer force of will. <laughs> I was in my my final term and we had auditions for the final term musical and I bombed it because I wasn't feeling confident in my voice. I didn't understand at the time what was happening. Um, but I was like, man, I'm not gonna go for the high note because I just can't. And and I, to be honest with you, like I was fairly confident that if I wasn't if I didn't have a vocal injury at that time, I probably would have been able to do what they were asking me because one of the guys on the panel knew me very well. He was like, whoa, Natalia, what was that? Can you try that again? But can you sing it the way you normally do? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I didn't go for it because I was just scared. Um, So I... I was in a position now where I was just in the chorus. I didn't have a lot of pressure on me vocally. um, And I got to basically take a little bit of a break. Um, But I was cast as an understudy. And one day they were like, hey, let's see what all the understudies can do. And I went up and I I couldn't sing. And it was just like, it was not great. But it wasn't that important because I was just in the background. I was in the chorus. So I made it through the program. It was fine. Um, and then things really started to hit home when I when I graduated um, and I was asked to come back to perform at Theatre Ontario. So they selected uh, a bunch of kids from that graduated from my program in my year to perform at the Theatre Ontario Showcases, which is where you get to perform and get like picked up um, for, you know, talent agencies and whatnot. Um, and I couldn't sing at that point. And I got an assessment done by a speech pathologist and I found out I had nodes. I saw them, have them on video. They look little, little sad. It was a sad time. <laughs> sad so, skin. Oh no. <laughs> sad little lumps. They were small, to be honest with you. Like I didn't have it very bad. I was very lucky. Like mine were very, very, very minor, but it's astounding at how like a millimeter of a callus could affect my voice so much that I didn't sing for two years after that because I just, I didn't know what to do. 
So it's, it's amazing when you, when you get into such high level and fine tuned performance, how much that little, little, little difference gets. I remember my sisters who both competed uh, for Team Canada in gymnastics. If they would grow an eighth of an inch, yeah. it would throw off they, their entire they, yeah. ability to do <laughs> mm -hmm. anything. And they would have to relearn all of the muscle memory because it's yeah. such fine tuned muscle memory. Um, so why don't you, so you have the nodes, you know, you have the nodes now, what was your path to rehabilitation? Because your voice sounds lovely. <laughs> Ooh, yeah, I worked hard. I worked really hard, man. I, I'm not going to undermine that. It was a process. I graduated like five years ago now. So for the first two years after I graduated my program, I was doing musical theater. So I was doing musicals. I was singing through it. When I was doing that Theater Ontario showcase and I came out and I tried to sing and it didn't happen. And in front of all of my classmates, I was like, hey, guys, I have notes. Big announcement. Um, my uh, artistic director of the program, she told me she uh, also got vocal nodules when she was touring, doing a show and she had to retrain it while she was in the show. She was like, it is possible. You can sing through it. You can train through it. I on an emotional level, couldn't handle it. I didn't want to face it for a long time um, because singing was my identity up until this point. I mean, honestly, like it still is. Um, but my whole life and everything I wanted was surrounded by my voice and what I could do vocally. All of a sudden, it felt like it was taken away. So I took a really big break. I actually didn't listen to music at all for two years. I didn't wow. sing for two years. You don't need to do that. That's the thing, though, is that I was made very aware that you can sing through nodules, just retrain. Um, you don't need to take crazy vocal rest. My nodules weren't that bad. I just, I couldn't handle it. And it was such an emotional block for me that I, like, I don't know. I just, I wasn't ready to face it. Time passed. Um, I was like, okay, you know, let's do this. Let's get my voice back. Um, I'm definitely healed now. Because the thing is too, you, all you've ever known is how you used to sing before. All of a sudden being like having it be known that that doesn't work and you're going to hurt yourself if you keep doing what you're doing. It's scary. Like, it's like, I don't know anything different. How do I know I'm not going to make this worse or get a vocal hemorrhage, which is even worse. So it's, it's definitely scary. Um, when the time came after those two years passed, I was like, Hey, let's go. Um, I met up with my speech pathologist again and I was like, Hey, I know you haven't heard from me in like two years, two years. but <laughs> I, I'm back and I'm purple. Forming, uh, so help me, please. Um, yeah, so she, you know, she gave me some exercises to just start slowly um, developing my confidence in a very gentle way and start working my voice again. Uh, and then she kept encouraging me to start just taking vocal lessons again um, with someone who matches my style. That I found was really important. Um, when you're in like a rehabilitation process, you really, really need to trust your team, 100%. Uh, I needed an ENT to do my actual like medical assessments and let me know if it was okay to sing. A uh, speech pathologist who was, you know, just has medical background and a heck of a lot of training and, you know, worked with me on that front as well. And she, I trusted her to develop the rest of my team, which then led into me finding my vocal coach. Um, it was a trial and error process. Uh, I was sent to a vocal coach who I paid almost $200 to just have me lay on the floor and breathe for an hour. <laughs> and I was so mad. I was so angry. Like, I was like, what is this? I'm I'm a singer. I'm a professional. I got this. I, I can do great things. I don't need to lie things. on the floor for an hour. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what made the, the process coming back so difficult. I'm like, I'm performing next week. And I came here with a song. And we didn't even touch the song. We just did breathing. So I was so frustrated. I didn't get it. But it all comes down to the same thing. You have to go back to basics. And you have to figure out where the problem came from. Is that the same coach that you're with now? 
No, I I had one session with her and I never went back. That honestly, <laughs> she was great. She was great. She probably would have been great for me, but I was just so I was like, I can't I do love this. your attitude on these things. She's like, oh, she would have probably been great, but I you, the the personal responsibility stuff. It's quite it is quite admirable. There you mm. go. I have a lot of respect for you yeah. and your uh, dedication to personal responsibility. Yeah, it's it's important to me. What can I say? Um, but yeah, I. She wasn't the greatest match for me. She was great. She knew her stuff. Um, but I needed, I, man, when I'm learning from someone, I have to trust that they equal or are higher than me intellectually. And if I don't feel like they know way more than I do, I won't respect their opinion. To be completely honest with you, I'm kind of like very judgmental in that way. If I'm trusting you with my career and my entire vocal future, I need to know that you know your shit and I need to know that you are Mm -hmm. way smarter than me and you can deal with my shit. So I I ask a lot of questions. I ask a hell of a lot of questions. Um, And I was talking to my speech pathologist too, like how do you find a good vocal coach? Because I was hunting one down. I couldn't find one. Um, I ended up coming across... Um, Ryan Luchuk, who is absolutely incredible and just really, 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 really knowledgeable. Um, and his diagnostic skills are freaking incredible. He understands coordination in your voice. Like I, I've never, ever, ever had such a productive vocal warm-up in my life where I can work on a song and be like, this song sounds like absolute shit. I can't get my voice together. What's happening? I got onto a class with him on uh, this week, actually. And he was like, oh, your folds aren't really coordinated today. Let's fix that. And I'm like, yeah, I just tried to sing this song and it sucked. <laughs> and then within 20 minutes, he's like, okay, we're going to work you and do this stuff. And I'm like, okay, sure. And then I sang the song and it was perfect. And he's just like so goddamn smart. Like, <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Crazy. So, mm-hmm, so yeah. Uh, w- was that ignorance? It was. Nice. <laughs> it nice. was. So that's a nice segue. Um, Ignorance being one of the songs that we're doing together, a Paramore mm-hmm, song. But mm-hmm. why don't you, uh, before we wrap up, just give us a little background and talk about um, your new journey into writing your own songs and making your own music. Oh my gosh, yeah. So, well, with coming back into my voice, I was like, I want to write again. Um yeah, I've always been writing since I was a really, really little child. And I just haven't felt ready to release any of my stuff. But this whole like vocal journey, I was like, damn, like I got to get some of this stuff out there. I want to start making this stuff actually into something and putting it out there. So again, I'm very picky with my team, Um, but I knew I needed somebody basically to get me off my ass and to start working. I do have a good work ethic. It's just like when it's all down to me, sometimes I let things slide and I'm not really on top of my shit. So, you know, I mean, Zach, like, can I, <laughs> can I just toot your horn for a second? But <laughs> oh, only if you must. <laughs> Honestly, though, like it was, it was so refreshing to finally be like, okay, I'm going to look at this like it's a professional project and I'm going to give it my all. Maybe this song freaking sucks. I don't care. I just need to start. Um, and that's kind of what happened. And, and we started working together in that more like structured setting and it made me more accountable for my shit. And I was like, okay, now I, I can't let this guy down. Like he's asking for my crap. <laughs> yep, yep. How long it, can it, I get letting away? Letting Zach down is a really hard thing oh to do. Oh my God. <laughs> but yeah, it really does come down to having a really good team. That's why I'm like, I'm super, super picky. And I'm like, I'm very watchful about the people around me. You know, you become the top five, 10 people that are around you in your lifetime, right? Right. So, you know, it's it's really important to me that I'm surrounded by people that I trust, I have faith in, I think know what they're doing. And and then that led into this this here new project, all this good stuff coming out. So Well, thank you. I appreciate the kind words. <laughs> very, very kind. It's been you go. an absolute blessing working with you. And uh I look forward to making many, many more songs together. Heck yeah. And having a lot of fun. <laughs> Maybe we yeah. should get her to do something on the Mucho record. I'm sure that we could I'm sure that we could do that. Yeah. That would be fun. Hell yeah. 
But yeah, we got um we got a single that will be coming out and then we also have a really dope Paramore cover that I'm dying to come in and record. So Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, where can people find you online, Natalia? I know that you talked about your studio, but um, plug whatever else that you want to plug. Where do people find you? Honestly, I'm most active on Instagram. So at Natalia Zook, that's, that's where you can find my stuff. I basically put everything in there. So you'll find my, my business life, my professional life, my music life, and a lot of pictures of my dog. <laughs> <laughs> and Zook is Z U K, not Z O O K. There we go. Correct. Because you're Polish. Correct. There we go. There we go. <laughs> well, Natalia, thank you so much for taking the time to come on our show today. Uh, just, I have so much respect for you and your work ethic and your personal responsibility and your entrepreneurship. Um, you're an amazing person. And uh, I'm thankful that we get to work together. Yeah, I'm excited. Thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Thank you for listening to The Canadian Story. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at The CAD Story. That's The C-A-D Story. If you enjoy this podcast, please share it with your friends and family. Let's work together to remind Canadians how great their country is.